gosh, you know, what do we possibly have to do to get treated well? This is an easy one, folks. Um, so, you know, treat others well. I, I mean, I, I uh, as I mentioned, I, I come from a family of ministers and broadcasters, and I am not religious at all. I'm deeply spiritual. I have no interest in isms, ologies, or osophies, or any of that. But I will say that if you had to pick a single teaching that just plain works, it, you know, it, it, it is, you know, do unto others or love thy neighbor. If yep. you just did that and nothing else, this would all be settled. <laughs> right. Welcome to Care More, Be Better, Be Better, a podcast for people like you who care about the social impact of conscious companies and everyday heroes. Hear inspiring stories from those who put people and planet before profit and personal gain. You'll learn how you can make a difference, vote with your dollars, and get involved today. Here's your host, Karina Belizzi. Hello, fellow do-gooders and friends. I'm your host, Karina Belizzi, an activist and cause marketer who's passionate about social impact and regeneration. Today, I'm joined by a fellow natural products industry veteran, Chris Killam. Chris is a medicine hunter and explorer who works with indigenous native people to promote sustainable botanical trade. He is the author of 15 books. He lectures all over the globe and has appeared on over 500 TV programs. The New York Times called Chris part David Attenborough, part Indiana Jones. Chris, welcome to the show. Thanks, Karina. It's great to be on with you. I'm, I'm happy that your podcast is doing so very well. That's good news. We need more positive material out there and less of a lot of the garbage that's floating around. <laughs> well, I'm glad that it's, it's rising. I'm now on the top two and a half percent, so that's always a good feel. That's but terrific. I, I have to say, I'm jealous of you being called the cross between David Attenborough and Indiana Jones, because these are two of my idols, seriously. Oh, you know, I mean, it was extremely kind of Andrew Downey who wrote that. But he got a good immersion, you know. I took him up to the Andes into Maca country uh, to, you know, see how botanical trade really happens. He's a very smart guy. And he wrote a beautiful, beautiful article about it for the Times. And any and all media that we can get for things natural, for indigenous people, for communities that most folks don't know about, really does help to kind of lift everybody over time. So that was a terrific thing. And yeah, I, I fell over backwards when I read that. I want to tell the story first of how we met as we get started, because okay. um, I've been working in the natural products industry since 1999, I, I was like fresh out of college. I joined Draco Natural Products, who was manufacturing some hundred plus herbal extracts. And I met you, the medicine hunter. Mm -hmm. uh, I recall, I think in our first meeting, I think we got into a deep discussion on green tea and all the different ways that it can be used and uh, all the health benefits of green tea. But I mean, that was more than 20 years ago now. I think it, it was 1999. Back. No, it goes fast, Karina, and you've done yeah. so many wonderful things in, in the scene. But no, you know, I like, one of the things I really like about the whole natural products world is you can go from, let's say, working with cereal grains to being a non-GMO campaigner to, you know, devoting yourself to fish oil to, you know, going on. And, and people just kind of consider it part of your aggregate body of knowledge rather than, oh, gee, they move around a lot. You know, it's like it's a, this great learning field. And I think it's wonderful that we have so many people, thousands of them actually, who are terrific resources with you know, specialized and generalized knowledge and in, in all the things that we care about that are that are in the natural sector. Yeah. I mean, I have a question for you that relates though. Given the time since then to this moment, I wonder what has changed about your perspective, if anything at all. What surprises you? Oh gosh. You know, I don't know that I'm exactly surprised. Uh, mm -hmm. I think the thing is that when you know, I got involved. I, I did my first work in the natural products industry in 1971 for food co-ops. And, you know, at the time we had this idea that, gee, maybe, you know, everybody could eat natural foods eventually. Wouldn't that be amazing? And, you know, change the health of the world and all that. And I think that a lot of the people who were 
fundamentally really idealistic at that time and who started all kinds of, uh, you know, companies, uh, Lundberg, Rice, and, you know, Celestial Seasonings, Teas, and, and on and on and on. They were really visionaries. And many of us were just kind of ardently devoted to this cause for which we took a lot of ridicule at the time. And, you know, I think that the vast industrialization of it is is a bit sad. The consolidation of brands and the winnowing out of full and regional brands in the business, I think that's really quite a shame. You know, I'm disappointed that Whole Foods has become bas basically a, a palace of clamshell plastic cases when they could actually do something good for the world and champion whole new worlds of packaging. I think, you know, our industry, unfortunately, at the very same time that so many good things are happening, has also fallen stupidly prey to things like single serve packaging for, say, organic goods. So 10,000 year trash for certified organic whatever, soup or something, that makes no sense. So <laughs> in some ways, I'm glad that many, many more people are uh, have available to them many natural brands that do, in fact, elevate their health and their nutrition. But on the other hand, I'm sad that we've lost so many of the core values, especially environmental and sustainable values, um, because it's all going to come crashing down around our heads, however organic we are, if we don't really take care of the planet. Well, Chris, I mean, you bring to mind for me something that I saw in Whole Foods that was quite astounding. They had taken an orange, peeled it, and sold it in a plastic cup with a plastic lid. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, and, and you know I feel the one. same way about the pomegranates that they've taken the work out of, like shelling the pomegranate, and they're selling it now to you with the kernels and this plastic thing, which is what? superfluous. Yeah, and you know what's stupid about that is the whole thing about a pomegranate is is eating it and figuring out, like, when did you first eat a pomegranate? When you were a kid? Gosh, it was always a, an incredible mess, but I loved it. And it yeah, was an experience. And, like, you, you dug into it. And it was a little bit hard to figure out how to do it. You know, like you start opening it and then all of a sudden you're all purple and there's all this stuff. That's eating a pomegranate. <laughs> You know? <laughs> yeah. I mean, it's what not, are we teaching oh, our kids? Yeah. It's not the little kernel is come in a small plastic cup. That's not okay. I mean, that that's just infuriatingly dumb as far as I'm concerned. Well, it blows my mind. It's the same thing with hard boiled eggs, right? Like now people are selling hard boiled eggs in plastic packaging. They've taken the trouble of shelling it out when the when nature has provided the perfect container for it already. And yeah, we're essentially think? saying we know better, <laughs> like make it out of plastic. <laughs> Well, it's good that we're getting some of this out of our systems, you know, but it's also, <laughs> it, it, you know, that's the thing is that I travel all over the world, Karina, as you know, although during COVID I haven't been doing so, but I see all kinds of clever ways that, uh, you know, people have in many places more sustainable packaging for food, you know, entire express stores in Europe that have, you know, paper packaging or cardboard packaging for sandwiches and soups and all kinds of takeout items, salads. And, you know, it's just smart and, and sane and utensils that can be easily disposed of that are, that are, you know, environmentally friendly. We're way behind here. And, and it's really, I think primarily to do with enormous pressure from the petroleum industry in, in ways that, you know, it's hard to comprehend unless you spend time in Washington just seeing the ugliness of it all kind of grind out. The ugliness of it all kind of grind out. <laughs> <laughs> I mean. Well, okay. Is, you know, we can put lipstick on a pig and say, you know, getting it, worse. <laughs> it, I think you just answered the question of what is 2022 if we were playing Jeopardy? <laughs> so, you know, I've seen some creative uses of things like even banana leaves in some other countries where they're literally using these things as the packaging to disperse products in. And oh, yeah. so I wonder if you see some of that creep coming in from some of these international spaces, if you have any sort of a purview on that. 
Well, you know, at, at the trade shows that we attend, you will see, especially in kind of the deep end of the dial, the so-called sustainable end, you know, you'll see people selling bamboo uh, based, you know, like pressed bamboo based utensils of different kinds and, and, you know, cups and bowls and things. A little bit of this creeps in, but for the most part, it just doesn't seem to be something that, that, a majority of people have caught on to. You know, I the first time I was in India back in 83, I went to a a feast at this temple and they made they had these bowls that were actually made of long leaves that were kind of wrapped together in a certain way and and then they had little pieces of almost kind of like toothpicks around the rim to hold them together. And they were serving a very very soupy dal and I thought, you know, this is just going to pour through these little things. It didn't. It didn't at all, you know. And then at the end of the meal, when everybody was done with it, the, they just threw these things into the fire. And it was done. We're way behind in the packaging world. And it's, it's unfortunate. We don't need single serve. Single serve organic should not be allowed to be called organic as far as I can figure. Yeah, I think I, I agree with you overall. One of the things I spoke about in a podcast that aired just about a week ago as we record this, uh, Dr. Vimal Thomas George, who wrote a book called Your Health in Flames, which is all essentially about how the economic disparity is actually pushing mm -hmm. more health challenges than you might think. And mm -hmm. so if you <laughs> make some specific choices to save more and consume less that you'll essentially be able to create a healthier life and even do passion projects as opposed to work for the nine to five. Mm -hmm. And so I thought that the interesting point that he made, the point I wanted to get to is that in India and in, in a lot of India, utensils would even be considered a non-necessary item because mm -hmm. of things like what you mentioned, that eat with their hands, sure. their hands work perfectly well, sure. it's attached to your body. You put sure. food in it, you put it in your mouth, right? Yeah. Wash your hands, use utensils that might just be crafted from something as simple as part mm -hmm. of a banana leaf. Yeah. So I think there's a disparity between how we see necessity and how other cultures see necessity. And so part of why I invited you to talk today has to do with your experience and really understanding the global perspective of what sustainability is your desire to help preserve the health of our home planet. We only have one. <laughs> and because of your important work in preserving the historical knowledge of indigenous people. So one of the things I hoped we could talk about was a little bit of a perspective on what you've learned from indigenous people around the globe about living more sustainably. Well, first of all, it, it, it is fair to say that most indigenous people are on the ropes. Okay. Um, I haven't actually ever seen an idyllic uh, indigenous community anywhere. I mean, I, I spend my entire career with indigenous people all over the world, whether it's in the mountains of Sichuan, China, or the Amazon, um, or Vanuatu, South Pacific. But, you know, the world has had a crushing effect on indigenous life everywhere, whether you're talking aboriginals in Australia, Maori in New Zealand, whether you're, you know, talking about people in, in Chile, or Mapuche people, I've spent time with them. They're all struggling because on all sides, they're getting pressure, mo mostly they're, they're getting pressure to die, okay? Um, they're a nuisance to large interests. So, you know, there's this constant pressure to get land, to uh, get their resources. And, and yes, there are some very, very good projects out there. But, the, you know, right now, indigenous people around the world are, are rapidly out of transition from really living with the rhythms of nature. I mean, if you go into the Amazon, if you go out into native communities and you just go to any shopkeeper and you say, take me into the forest and show me medicinal plants, oh, they can show you a hundred of them. 
I mean, they have that basic knowledge. Like, oh yeah, my grandmother always boils this. You know, if you're sick, you know, and then you know, it goes through the whole bit. You know, but but I don't really know that much. I mean, you can find that kind of knowledge, and in that sense, people are in fact more in the rhythms of nature, mostly because they're surrounded on all sides by um, nature that's being rapidly, rapidly defiled and destroyed. I um, mean, you see this in Congo, you see this in Ivory Coast, you see this all over the place. You see this in Thailand, Malaysia. Malaysia was a splendor of tropical rainforest, the oldest rainforest on earth, 60 million years old. And now, you know, a much smaller amount of it remains because they basically took tens of millions of hectares of land and bulldozed and burned them down so that they could grow palm so that they could be a player in the palm oil market. And palm oil is a race to the bottom of the economic ladder. But, but, but. So one thing I've learned from indigenous native people is that they have all kinds of different ways of adapting to this. Some of them wind up, you know, predictably becoming more consumer oriented because they see stuff that they like and they want it to. There are often divisions in different places between people who choose to be more, quote, traditional and people who choose to be more modern. So like in Vanuatu, South Pacific, uh, where I've spent a lot of time since 95, there are some villages that still, re still remain, however few there are, wearing traditional garb, uh, men wearing a penis sheath, women wearing what look like grass skirts, but are actually made from the inside of a, a bark of a particular tree. Um, but mostly, you know, the villages now are people in flip-flops and drawstring shorts, you know, and, and t-shirts or, or polo shirts or whatever, and flip phones. And uh, it's a rapidly changing scene. So, you know, I, I think that one of the most wonderful things I have learned uh, from indigenous native people is that is their sense of community. For the most part, what I've seen in different communities throughout the Americas and Asia and, and different in, in the Pacific Islands and different places is that there's more of a sense of community cohesion in villages. There just is, you know, and, and, People take care of each other's kids and there's much more sharing and there are more feasts that people have together. And, and that cohesion keeps communities stronger. And we lack a, a lot of that. I mean, I know people find community in many different ways here, but I, I think the simplicity of it, the living, the living with people in the same village and the growing up multi-generationally and the taking care of each other's kids and the being kids together and then winding up being grandparents together, it, it, it does something pretty wonderful to a group of people. Uh, if they're if they're not you know terribly disadvantaged, I've found indigenous native people to be remarkably resourceful. Um, one time I was up on a, a very far out island uh, right on the northern Malaysian southern Thailand border, and a kampong that is an an, uh, an island dedicated to the um, Malaysian Aboriginal people there, the Oring Osley. And the first time I went there, the scene was, was desperately poor. It was awful, awful. Uh, the poverty was just extraordinary and sad and hard to watch and hard to be around. And about four years later, I went back to the same place. And as soon as we started pulling up to the boat, I saw that people had clean clothing, they looked better. They looked better groomed. Uh, there were lots of changes on this island. And I asked and I said, you know, to the one person who could speak with them, I said, I need to know what has changed because it's something radical. And we talked with them for a while. And then they said, well, what has changed is we found sandalwood in the forest. And I was like, oh, because sandalwood is worth a fortune. So they'd go in periodically, cut a little bit, sell it to the perfume industry, make a lot of money, improve their community. So one of the things I have learned from indigenous people is they're endlessly creative when it comes to finding ways to keep alive. <laughs> well, you've just shared so much to unpack from deforestation that like ultimately where we're planting a bunch of palm trees to get the palm oil out uh, and 
taking forests away from the orangutan. I mean, this is exactly the reason I try to avoid palm oil in every mm -hmm. product I work sure. to formulate over the years, even sure. if it was a great alternative to homogenize something. Yeah. And so it's just important, I think, that as consumers, we think about these things true. When we hear about palm oil, we say, okay, well, you could have the most safe palm oil forest in the world that may claim not to deforest, but just by even supporting that industry in a way, we're supporting mm -hmm. that industry. And yes. so that's one of the delicate things I think about being in the natural food space is, is that you have to sometimes balance those things and really think about the in intended and unintended consequences of your formulary choices even. Oh, I, I agree. I agree. And, you know, uh, there was one thing I additionally wanted to mention about indigenous people, at least in my experience, Karina. I have been treated over the years with extraordinary hospitality, generosity, kindness. You can't believe the things that people have done for me. And one of the things that happens almost all the time if I go to a faraway place is I show up. I, I, I don't go roaming around by myself. I usually have a team of people. But, it, you know, working for a purpose with particular plants, whether it's tea or ginseng or something, shizandra berry, ashwagandha, whatever. If I show up in a community, if our team shows up in a community, people will just drop what they're doing and say, what do you need? And we say, well, we're kind of here to see, you know, like, is anybody harvesting coffee? And they go, yeah, my aunt's harvesting coffee. Come with me. And they will abandon their day utterly. <laughs> just do it out of kindness on two occasions in the South Seas. And I know this sounds not, not even credible. On two occasions, my friends built me a house just so I'd have a nice place to stay. Wow. <laughs> I mean, when's the last time you built a house for a guest? Like never, you know? <laughs> but so I am, I am often just mind blown by the generosity of people and also by the sense of time. You know, you go to Morocco and, you know, where it's mostly Muslim and that means hospitality, among many other things. You have what they call a small tea, which is, you know, tea and bread and dried fruits and fresh fruits and melon and honey and raisins and <laughs> dates and nuts and cheeses and, and you have to eat it, okay? You can't yeah. go, oh, well, thanks. I'll have a little. No, 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 that's not going to work out. That's You've got to sit you know, down. You have to enjoy like, the meal. <laughs> and, 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 and the deal is it's like it's happening until the guy in the turban says, okay, we're done. Let's go out into my orchard now, you know? And there's this whole sense of, you know, you're not in charge of the time. You're there. It's a different scene. Just relax into it. Enjoy it. Thank them. You know, I, I have had hundreds of conversations with people across languages. And what I mean by that is I talk with Arabic people all the time. They don't have a clue what I'm saying, Karina. And then they talk with me cheerfully for five, 10 minutes. I got no idea what they're talking about. But, but, but there's, <laughs> there's something about the moment and the time, you know, like if you're going along in the woods and somebody and somebody's, you know, speaking in Altai, you know, in Southern Siberia, and they're pointing to something and they tell, you can kind of get the gist that they're saying, wow, isn't this really majestic and amazing and beautiful? Do you have anything like this back home? And, then, you know, and, and, and so that's all by way of saying that I have found the the actual spirit of the people that I've met all over the world to be pretty damn wonderful and uh, unfailingly kind toward me. I'm I'm so grateful for the experience. Well, I have to say, I think part of the reason that you encounter so much of this is because you approach everything you do. I think with an innate curiosity. Oh, thank you. There isn't a lot of. I've never felt like there was a moment where you were judging the experience or the people you were with. And I've observed you in many different settings. So, I mean, even just looking at how you're presenting your thoughts and ideas on social media to try and get people to think about indigenous peoples or plants in a different way, to think about access to these things in a different way. It's like you're always kind of coming at it from this educational and curious perspective that is kind of in a way beautifully childlike. <laughs> well, 
Thank you. Thank you. You know, my, uh, I had ministers and broadcasters in my family. Uh, mm -hmm. So I've always had a, you know, you got to do good for the world kind of attitude. That was just sort of part of the, you know, the basics of the family ethos. And, um, and the tell the world part was obviously the broadcasting part. I think that one of the greatest joys I've, I've ever had has been in the endless, say, hundreds of shows or <laughs> seminars in which I've been able to show people, you know, whether I'm showing them people in Siberia or people in, uh, you know, uh, Hunan, China, or, or people in Vanuatu or Chile or Thailand or whatever. But a long time ago, my first trip to the Amazon, I wound up meeting a 103-year-old woman shaman named Maria Sina. And she, oh, we chased her around a bunch. We couldn't find her. It was, <laughs> it was one of those deals. They'd show up and they go, oh, yeah, man, she left about an hour ago. <laughs> You know, <laughs> this went on for days. You know, just like, we played, it was like, where's Waldo? You know, where, where the hell is this woman? You know, we go to her house. Oh, no, man, she left for, you know, you're in Duba. She, you know, anyway. She was finally, on the move at 100. We finally found her, you know, and she was incredibly tiny. She was 103, and, and but she was brilliant. And, the, but the gist of the story is she, she looked at me and she said, you bridge the worlds. And it was kind of like, yeah, okay, I'm all ears now. And she said, you have to do this. You have to share about e each other. You have to share about other cultures. You need to go around and do this. You need to foster understanding. She'd never met me before. She didn't get any introductions to me. She didn't know about my work, but she just nailed it. And I really took that to heart. You know, I mean, I'd been doing that, but the whole idea of bridging worlds, we live in such a fractious time. You know, I see... I hate to say it, but I see projects out there like um, the Harvesters of Devil's Claw in Namibia. Y you couldn't find a poorer group of people, really. I mean, desperate poverty is the exact description, okay? You know, a, a lot of the botanical world works on the back of, of the poverty of people. And, you know, the price kind of holds in the sort of $3 a kilo region. Mm. Now, here's the crazy thing. If it were $6, you could revolutionize the lives of thousands and thousands of people and dozens of villages overnight. And the end difference to a civilization of people who will faithfully walk into a chain store and come out with a $4 coffee every single damn day of their lives, it's meaningless. 25 cents more a bottle for the supplements, who cares? We have a lot of pressure, downward pressure on pricing, and that harms indigenous people and communities terribly, terribly. Yeah. You know, I got to still I got to tell that story a bit from the eyes of Mokhtar Al Khanchali, who is mm -hmm. the CEO and founder of Port of Mocha, which is a coffee company that is working to bring really good quality coffee from Yemen to oh. the States. And so he um this is in my first 20 episodes. I don't remember which one exactly, mm -hmm. but I'll send you the link after because I think you'll enjoy the story I'd love he it. tells. I'd love it. He has such an incredible way of telling the story from the perspective of an entrepreneur too, because he's coming in and he's seeing how these people are living and how they were growing the coffee and how they were curing the coffee mm. and the types of, um, let's just say it wasn't very clean. It wasn't very precise and the quality of the coffee would end up being worse as a result. Right. And so he came in with a technologist perspective, helped them fix some of how they were growing and curing the coffee yeah. and committed to pay what is four times what any other company was paying them to help elevate the growers to a standard of living that would be yeah very good by comparison right. to where it had been right. and then commercialize it and sell it here in the United States. He sent and me some of the coffee. It's some of the most divine coffee I've ever tasted and I'm a coffee snob. So he's doing well, something right. Yemen coffee, you know, to the best of our knowledge, coffee happened in Yemen second only to Ethiopia. You know, yep. it spread from Ethiopia into Yemen and, mm -hmm. and Yemen actually is probably where it was first made into a hot beverage. And, and the thing you just described is that you do have people, 
you know, who will do projects like that. I mean, like I, you know, I really love the, the folks at Sambazon Acai. They're good friends. I've been in the Amazon with them a few times. You know, mm -hmm. they do good things for the communities. It's not hard to do the right thing. It's not hard to say, gosh, you know, it would really be a better world if the people that we acquire our botanicals from didn't live in desperate poverty and have trouble feeding their children. You know, for a few cents more, that can be accomplished. So we have some, you know, rethinking to do about what kind of human beings we want to be, not only in terms of treating other human beings, but also naturally, and I know this is a big, big focus for you, treating the natural environment. I mean, I, I see things I'm so sorry I've ever seen just because it's such wholesale destruction out there. I, you know, I sometimes images come up and I just wish I could get rid of them for good sometimes. Mm -hmm. uh, we're doing terrible things out there. And uh, this is not a sustainable situation. And every time there's a new, uh, you know, United Nations report or urgent warning or, you know, 16,000 more scientists got together and concluded that we're running out of time, you know, you know, people just go on and there's not enough sense of urgency about it. And, and it's a shame because, you know, we have the capacity to create a very, very good world. We have people who have modeled things like the man you're talking about, Mokhtar. We need hundreds and hundreds of thousands of projects like that just humming along all the time to reshape the entire landscape, you know, mentally, socially, environmentally, economically, the whole kit. Completely agree. A couple of other brands came to mind as you were talking about that with Samazon, but Alafia, what they're doing for Shea butter out of Africa, uh -huh. as an example. Uh -huh. I mean, there are there are several that are doing really, really good things. And then you have this other side of the equation in the natural foods environment where people are trying to create a new technology to make a food that might be just very expensive to create. Like I'm just thinking about things like lab grown meats as an, as a, for example, right? <laughs> is lab grown meat. I know, it is funny, right? So, oh, oh God. Yeah, I know. I know. It's like growing the ear on the back of a mouse. It's just, bleh. okay, go, go on. But, but like lab grown meats, like people are talking about bringing them to market now, like actually mm -hmm. having a viable product that they would sell right. alongside or in competition with the impossible burgers of the world. Right. Right. And I mean, you could, I, we could talk for a while about impossible burger. I'm not confident that an approach like that is actually doing it anything necessarily good, but you know, okay. There's all these novel approaches to foods where it's like, we're saying, oh, we'll throw technology at it. And then we throw technology at something and it doesn't necessarily solve the problem that it's seeking to solve. And it creates another slew of problems that we haven't yet really identified. And so mm. I just, you know, it's one of the things about human nature that is continuing to come up for me is like we as man in this extractive world think we can solve it by just doing X, Y, and Z. Yeah. And sometimes we just need to look to, I think, some of the cultures of the world and how they're solving problems and how we might scale those things in a fair and equitable way. Well, if you, if you look at a lot of communities out there, I mean, for example, you know, they shop every day. They yeah. go to the market. The fruits and vegetables are fresh. They buy them that day. They go home and they make, you know, whatever they make. If they're in Thailand, maybe they make a pumpkin curry. I mean, you know, whatever it is. Uh, there's a lot of local agriculture and small production. It's not a consolidated, uh, high chemical input agricultural uh, type of environment. And that's great you know you have and then you, of course you have people making specialty foods you know making a relish or making a a sauce or make you know you go to jamaica and there are women all over the island who are famous for oh no 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 you haven't had jerk sauce till you've had you know <laughs> annabelle's jerk sauce i'm telling you what you think you've had jerk sauce you don't know anything you know that kind of deal mm -hmm. but it's great it's great and one of the things that i I'm, I'm really fortunate with is that I've gotten to gotten to eat all over the world. Okay. And sometimes, I mean, uh, do I, I'll, I'll tell you a quick story. I was in Vanuatu with some friends in a, in a village that was as close to 
anything you've ever seen uh, described as a tropical paradise ever in your life. A crescent-shaped beach, huts all around it, facing a live volcano across the bay. <laughs> I mean, wow. you know, it just nailed it, okay, in every way. And and my, my friends, my native friends, who, by the way, are more fit than you could ever be if the only thing you ever did for your whole life was work out. They say to me, hey, you want to go to the waterfall and then eat lunch? There's only one answer to that is, yes, of course, I want to go to the waterfall and then eat lunch. So one guy has a sack, a couple guys have machetes, one person brings a box of matches protected in plastic. We all head off to the waterfall, which is so splendid that you just want to weep with joy that you have the, the experience of being there in this beautiful water that you can drink and swim in. And so we do that for a while, and then we climb, climb way up a hill. And as we go along, the guys go into a stream, and they scrape underneath the banks of the stream, and they get these big freshwater prawns, and they throw them in the bag. And we go along, we find some taro and some yams and some coconut and some bananas and a bunch of other things. And we get to a clearing and then we make a little fire and then we prepare the yams and taro and the shrimp and the coconut and all that, wrap it up in the banana leaves, cook it on the fire. And once we started to eat this about 45 la minutes later, we all looked at each other and we all burst out laughing because we knew this was like the best that you could possibly have. There was no better thing you could do at the time. and. You know, I think that we we miss out, the point to that is we miss out a lot on the joys of, of actually cooking, of, mm -hmm. of doing things around food. Uh, you know, they have this great, great thing in uh, Grenada called oil down. One, <laughs> one person brings a pot to the beach, so a cooking pot. Somebody brings some cooking oil. Somebody brings some onions. Somebody brings some carrots. Somebody brings some fish, this and that, you know, salt the whole bit. They all show up, they throw it in the pot, they make this stuff that's categorically delicious. And if you're walking by, they will insist that you have some. And it's delicious. And so how they do it is just this kind of community thing. You know, six, eight people go, yeah, let's do an oil down. We miss out on a lot of that with all this packaged crap and, and the industrialization of food. You know, it, it takes a lot of the joy out of it. And, and in other countries, you, you go to Italy, you know, <laughs> I mean, Italy's the best food place on earth. If they want to have a two hour lunch, they'll have a two hour lunch. And yeah, it includes wine, you know, <laughs> and then you go back and you work and you be productive. We've really lost something with our connection with food. Yeah. Well, was that too rambling? No, okay. I just am honestly, I was propelled on a journey with you right then. Oh, um, oh. I mean, I don't think that I have a single experience that really parallels your hike to that waterfall. Mm -hmm. And that saddens me. You know, I mean, I might have come close with a cookout or something to that effect, but yeah, literally harvesting from the forest farm right then from the creek that's right there or from the river that's right there, yeah. getting that food, spending that time together, having it be this quality engagement where you weren't watching the clock and you were just, you know, living in concert with the environment and its pure state, which is just a beautiful story. Yeah. And, and it, it's, you know, the, what do we do with the moments of our lives? You know, that's the thing. My friends and I were in Sichuan in the mountains, and there's a an indigenous group there. They're not Han Chinese. And we went to their town, and it was the middle of the day, and we were going by a school, and I said to the driver, stop, stop, get, you know, stop this van. And we stopped it, and I got out, and, and a couple of guys I was with got out, and we walked right into the school. Mm. And... Um, <laughs> It was pandemonium as soon as we <laughs> walked in. They had never seen a foreigner, ever, oh, okay, never. never. And all of a sudden, this tall American walks in and two French guys, and they got video cameras. And the teacher was great. She took one look at me, and she went, like, oh, that's <laughs> it for the day. And 
we took all those kids to the town square, which was only about a block away. And then the parents came out. We spent hours photographing each other endlessly and looking at women pounding tobacco and being taken into people's homes and, and making, you know, I mean, making a real connection with this community. And that's, you know, I think if we could have more experiences like that, and I know that not everybody can travel, but I mean, if we can have more experiences where we're doing something joyful and maybe completely unexpected, you know, we can really have a better experience in this world socially among us instead of feuding over, you know, idiots like Donald Trump and stuff <laughs> that just doesn't matter. <laughs> well, oh, God. <laughs> Uh, thank you for letting me rant. Uh, oh. it's, it's cleansing, actually. Oh. Well, I don't see it as a rant. The reality oh. for me is that I, I look at this conversation as probably the highlight of my week. Oh, you have to consider, you. too, the fact that we're in uh, these COVID times still. Yeah. And I'm dealing with eruption after eruption. So I'm somewhat isolated. And so as we talk about community and these types of experiences that I think many people are longing to have, oh, yeah. it just reminds me of the wanderlust that I've been putting to bed for a long time. Mm -hmm. The desire I have to go see and be in other spaces with other people yep. and just living in a different culture for a while because yep. it's so eye-opening when you do that, when you see that the way that you do things, like when you live in the fact that it it's not the way everyone does things mm -hmm. and that different isn't necessarily better, but different offers perspective in a way that hearing about it just doesn't like you talked about oh, yeah. the two hour lunches in Italy. I was in France living in a very, very small town where that was the same norm. Sure. And if you started to try and like <laughs> clean up your dishware when you were like half hour into the meal, they'd look at you like you were crazy. What are you doing? You're just no. like, yeah. we haven't gotten yeah. to the fruit yet. Are you <laughs> sick? <laughs> right. <laughs> Have you fallen ill? Right. <laughs> yeah. And I think, you know, those cultures, um, they invite you to slow down. Yeah. yeah. And one of the things that I think that we have lost is we have this perspective that slow is somehow bad or you're not productive enough if you're mm, not right. doing six different things at once. Right, right, and right. I just, I just don't think that we have necessarily all the right answers, but the key to happiness is not sitting there on the hamster wheel every hour of your day. So, yeah. You know what is a happy experience? Sitting around a fire. <laughs> um, yes. I have sat around fires in endless places all over the world and you don't have to know the same language. Uh, I mean, I've, you know, we've sat around telling stories in different languages around fires uh, many nights that I've enjoyed out there. And, you know, people have been staring into fires for millions of years. And there's an example of something that, I mean, provided you do it safely, and it's obviously not in a, in a high-risk fire area. But, I mean, you know, it's easy. It's beautiful. Uh, it's something that brings people together. Uh, maybe food shows up. Maybe music shows up. Maybe a little bit of drink shows up. Maybe a little bit of cannabis shows up. You know, anything can happen. But you know, a lot of the pleasures don't have to be the brand new Maserati. I mean, I, <laughs> I don't give a crap about the brand new Maserati. I care about, you know, people having good experiences in life. Yeah. So I'm curious, you've done so much work in media over the years. Mm -hmm. 500 different TV shows, as for example, TV and radio. You had your own radio show. Yeah. You've been able to use your voice to communicate your thoughts for a long, long time now. So what what is the message that you are the most connected to or the most proud of in that time? Actually, this will surprise you. I, I had nine years on Fox. Uh, I was on the Fox News Network in 100 countries. And I, you know, I love, like, if I get up and I speak in front of a, a room full of herbalists, for example, I mean, I'm in ecstatic bliss. You have to <laughs> practically nail my toes to the floor, you know, because like, oh, my God, my people. But but I also found <laughs> being on Fox that I was able to get messages out to millions of people, messages about herbal uh, health, 
about indigenous communities, about the value of psychedelics and, uh, you know, psychiatric therapy, about all kinds of things, about organics, about sustainability. And, you know, I also did things that were just plain entertaining. I mean, weird food segments and stuff like that. But that time enabled me to reach a lot of the people that we don't reach within our own it's not a bubble, but I mean, within our own sphere. Mm-hmm. And that stepping out um, was really, and, and the the loads of appearances that I did on the Oz show back in the days when it was really good, reaching millions of people who hadn't heard these messages over and over again. I know for sure that many people tried herbs as a result of those segments and, and those, those messages and thought more about organics and, and any number of other things. So it's really, a, as is the case with you, you don't have a single message. You have a, a mixed message that's cohesive and all fits together, you know, health and sustainability and living well and living right and all of that. Uh, I got to do it on a global stage in 100 countries. And, you know, those days are gone. Uh, They were gone with the 2016 election when Fox News just became this, you know, corrupt miasmic cesspool (laughs) of bad everything. (laughs) But, you know, I, I think that reaching people who aren't already the converted and doing so in a way that, you know, we used to get comments people appreciated the heck out of stuff. That to me is very satisfying. And I think if we can reach as far as possible beyond our own group, beyond our own tribe, if you will, you know, beyond our own, uh, what Kurt Vonnegut used to call our own carass, really reach out far, really stretch far. That's where a lot of the unexpected, surprising, wonderful change happens. I mean, Oddly enough, if you go look online, there's this thing called Fox News finally admits that marijuana is safe. (laughs) That was me. (laughs) That was me. I was sitting doing a segment with Manny Alvarez. And he says, well, like, you know, what about, what about marijuana? I go, come on, Manny. Everybody knows it's safe. We all know it's safe. And that, that, (laughs) you know, oddly enough became the moment that that like bell ringer moment mm-hmm. that now you know zillions of places all over online that's proof you know <laughs> so, right so suddenly now it's okay for <laughs> for republicans to also smoke pot <laughs> right 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 so you know i i like the go i i have a sort of a go big or go home attitude mm-hmm. and so far thank goodness it has it has been more helpful than not and um i just want to keep reaching far Yeah. Well, I think reaching across the aisle and reaching as far as you can and whatever that aisle is. I was actually in a clubhouse room earlier today where I mentioned a podcast that I had heard um, where Abe Eats was or Abe's Eats was featured. And the founder of this company created halal kosher foods to serve Mm. both communities, right? Was one of the first to do so. And what he started to do was organize meals in San Francisco. This is just before COVID hit, right? Mm -hmm. Where he would invite Hasidic and Orthodox Jews, Muslims, atheists, and Christians (laughs) to a dinner and then make them sit like in an all mixed up fashion, (laughs) like be like a several course meal. We could talk about that two to three hour dinner or whatever, right? Right. And the first time he did it, it was kind of an experiment. And so he shares this story on a few podcasts and it's like, you know, I wasn't sure at the end when, you know, this Orthodox Jewish lady I'd invited was approaching me with kind of a shaking fist. Mm Mm-hmm if I was going to get a tongue lashing or more. And what she ended up sharing was that she was thankful for the experience that I had changed her mind, not just Uh, opened her mind, but changed her mind with regard to how she saw these people that were other than her. Sure. Sure. And I think those moments are really, really powerful, especially as we're in this very divisive world. Like we need to seek where we're common because there's, there's far more that's common than separate. And, Mm -hmm. you know, yes, we each have our own ideas, but really those are just thoughts and 
we should treat each other well and, and try to live well and do good. <laughs> it just seems so simple. Well, yes. And we have a lot to unwrap. I mean, I drive a car, okay? I, yeah. I pollute the environment. I buy petroleum products. I fly around the world. I use jet fuel. I mean, that's not lost on me. You know, we're participants in the problem, in, in a greater problem. Uh, mm -hmm. And it's not really possible to extricate yourself unless you want to go live in a tar paper shack in the woods, you know, and that's no solution because you don't help anybody doing that. So, yeah, it, these are challenging times. But I think that if we're simultaneously communicating about these issues and also doing, you know, practical earthly work that's that represents those values you know it, it's the best we can do uh, one of the overwhelming things that happens in people's minds and hearts is that uh, often people feel so badly about what's going on in the world that they feel that the burden's too great for a person to carry of course it's too great for a person to carry but if all of us carry a little bit of it well then it's not you yeah. know nobody expects one i mean the people who expect one person to come save everybody are delusional <laughs> it's never going to happen. There's not yeah. going to be a Messiah who just shows up and goes, been a mess. You've had a really rough ride, but I'm going to fix it all. That's not going to happen. Yeah. We're, we're all that being together. That's the only way it works. And then nobody really has to feel overwhelmed that the weight of the world is entirely on them because it can't be and shouldn't be. Yeah. I mean, this is going right back to my review of Paul Hawkins book, Regeneration. Mm. I mean, he makes a statement in there that you can't solve the world's problems. It's just the reality, you know, mm -hmm. it's like, but we can we all be part of it and it can right. be something we do together and it can be community effort and it can be something that becomes beautiful and it's going to take work and it's going to take time and it's not going to happen overnight. But, you know, the climate crisis isn't going away. Wildfires right. are going to rage around the globe again the next fire mm -hmm. season. Sure. And we'll have to contend with those things. I personally think that those events will bring more people into the fold, but it's not going to happen overnight. And you really don't know. Human behavior is a complex and tricky thing. <laughs> it is. It is. But if you can connect through kindness, through hospitality, through mutuality, I mean, you can discover wonderful things about each other. That's yes. the thing. You know, people talk endlessly about how, oh, the French are so snotty to American visitors. I mean, <laughs> I've been to France like three dozen times. I've never had that happen. No. Nope. You know, everybody treats me nicely. Mm -hmm. You know, I treat them nicely. <laughs> I mean, it, it, this is not a hard formula, okay? Yeah. This is not like, gosh, you know, what do we possibly have to do to get treated well? This is an easy one, folks. Uh, so, you know, treat others well. I, I mean, I, I, I uh, as I mentioned, I, I come from a family of ministers and broadcasters, and I am not religious at all. I'm deeply spiritual. I have no interest in isms, ologies, or osophies, or any of that. But I will say that if you had to pick a single teaching that just plain works, it, you know, it, it, it is, you know, do unto others or love thy neighbor. If yep. you just did that and nothing else, this would all be settled. <laughs> right. Well, Chris, is there a final thought you'd like to leave the audience with or a question you wish I had asked that I haven't. And if you have one of those, feel free to ask and answer it. Yeah, actually, one thing that I would like to say is that, you know, I'm deeply involved in the natural scene and have been since I was a teenager, which was a long time ago. And <laughs> during COVID, I have been an outspoken advocate of science. I read WHO every day, CDC, SIDRAP, British Health Authorities. I read individual reports. I read the vaccination reports and development trials. You name it. I've had time on my hands. Mm -hmm. And I have put this out in a lot of social media. And I've been very, very disappointed by a lot of the crackpot um, responses that I've gotten from people in our scene. 
you know, yeah. people who are totally vociferous anti-vaxxers. So, you know, you know, we thought we didn't realize you were such a coward. I mean, it just kind of goes on and on and on and on. Yeah, you I've know, had to distance myself from uh, some of, I'm sure, our mutual friends in the industry. For yeah, this. It's not an either or proposition. Yeah. You know, we use natural agents as much as we can, but I travel with ciprofloxacin because a very few times when I've been out there and I've been hit by dysentery, it has saved me from grave, grave harm. And we need to get real about the fact that some of these things, you know, I was a kid, there was polio. There was a guy in my neighborhood with polio. That made it real. Mm -hmm. And I tell you, all I needed was to see one image on TV, one time of a kid in an iron lung. And I was like, give me the vaccine. Yeah, don't want I don't that. care if you have to chop off my shoulder, you know? <laughs> you know, because yeah. you didn't want that. And we've really gone a little bit Looney Tunes and off the bend and just plain completely crackpot wacko in some ways. Homeopathic vaccinations, give me a break. You'll die. <laughs> um, you know, you got to get real about, about the fact we're real human beings living in real human bodies exposed to viruses that we have never encountered before to which we have absolutely no immune capacity to defend ourselves, we need help. And it's not going to come from taking more vitamin D. So yeah. <laughs> that's what I, that's well, the one thing I wanted to say. <laughs> one thing I will say, I've been taking my vitamin D more oh, sure. religiously than I probably ever did in the past. Yep. But you know, I also, I have very old relatives. Like yeah. my in-laws are almost 90 and, and 90, right? Yeah. I would like to see them have a hundredth birthday and not just be dismissed into this. Well, they were really old and they lived a good life. Sure. I like them sure. to know their grandkids. And like, mm -hmm. I think that's the challenge. That's part of why the social circles have shrunk for a while. Like I can't yeah. have these get togethers and have those experiences around the fire that I might want to have the same way. Because I also know that every time I expose myself to somebody else, it could run the risk of then infecting family members who are very aged. Yeah. And so, um, you know. My wife's parents are, are equally aged in 89 and 94. Mm -hmm. and, you know, they're in New Zealand. We can't get to them anyway uh, because of restrictions. But um, mm -hmm. no, you know, you, you don't want to spread this. This is a real thing. And I am disappointed that, that some seemingly very intelligent people have gone off the deep end with this. Um, people that we know and love. <laughs> yeah. 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 Well, it's easy to judge when it doesn't affect you directly. And so I've seen a few that have, you know, gone through some mind changes over sickness, but, yeah. you know, I have friends who work as doctors and, and nurses and are at the hospitals and dealing with these things on the day to day. And the stories that they tell are frightening. Oh yeah. In fact, oh, yeah. Uh, yeah, one of my friends, she's an author and she wrote a book about it and I recorded a podcast, <laughs> mm -hmm. which was 2021, the year of the nurse. That's mm. the book that she wrote by Cassie Alexander. And, you know, she worked through the pandemic as one of the first nurses on the front line in Silicon Valley. Oh, and the wow. reason that she was on the front line and that she volunteered for that was multifold. She does not have children, right? Mm -hmm. She has a husband. He's relatively healthy. She's healthy. She also worked in the burn unit. Mm -hmm. And as somebody who worked in the burn unit was very accustomed to the isolation gear that you have to wear to treat COVID patients. Oh, right. Sure. Sure. So, you know, one of the challenges that these nurses and doctors were going through is having to wear this kind of garb for an entire shift oh, yeah. was something oh, yeah. that was very hard for them to get used to. Some were having almost claustrophobic attacks because of it and mm -hmm. a lot of anxiety. It would actually spur up anxiety. And so she's like, I'm taking one for the team. This is what I'm doing. Yep. And over yep. the course of that year had a complete mental collapse because mm -hmm. it was just so hard to see so many people die that she treated. It's a terrible thing. It's a terrible thing. And, and, you know, people are understandably anxious and upset mm -hmm. and sleeping poorly and all of that. And, and, you know, if there ever was a time to be kind and caring and considerate of others, it's now. And I flew a couple of times back and forth across country in the past few months. And I'll tell you, it's no fun to sit, you know, to walk into an airport and know that from that point until you walk out of the airport at your destination, you're going to, you're going to be in a mask, you know, mm -hmm. and to have that the whole time and to have to deal with that. 
and all the cleaning procedures and you walk on a plane and they hand you an alcohol wipe first thing. I mean, it's a different world and people are wicked stressed out. And yes, <laughs> there are supplements that help that, <laughs> you know, whether you're talking rhodiola or ashwagandha or, you know, lemon balm or, you know, passion flower, or kava, any number of things that can calm you down. But it's a rough, rough, rough time for humanity. And, and what I hope, and I don't know this, nobody knows this, is that we don't get a variant that has the transmissibility of Omicron and the fatality of Delta. If we do them, then that's a whole other thing. But uh, right now it appears as though cases are slowly going down in many, many places that have been hotter over the past few weeks. So we can only hope that that's a continuing trend. Yeah. Well, thank you for bringing it up. It's a touchy subject and one I've probably avoided more than I like to admit on this particular podcast, partially yeah. because I want to reach as many people as possible, mm -hmm. like extend yeah. that out. And frankly, discussions about vaccination shut down half of the audience that I might reach yeah. in some cases. So yeah. that's a tough one, but I appreciate the conversation. And um, yeah, I think my point of view is fairly obvious here. I'm vaccinated. My family's vaccinated. My yeah. four-year-old can't be yet, but you yeah. know, we're yeah. doing it. Well, you know, with my work, I mean, I have to be vaccinated for hepatitis A, hepatitis B, Japanese encephalitis, yellow fever, tetanus, mm -hmm. because what you don't want to do is wind up in um, someplace really far away with hepatitis. Right. <laughs> then, then, you're, then you're in grave, grave trouble. And I just see this as part of, of living a, a, a modern life. You know, we we get more and more exposed to pathogens of all different kinds and they mm -hmm. travel more freely around the world than ever before. And so the needs and requirements of civilizations are different than they ever have been. Yep. Well, thank you, Chris. I thank could speak for another you. hour to you <laughs> easily. <laughs> well, you're, you know, you're a wonderful interview. I got to say, I mean, you know, it, w one of the things that I appreciate is that you're prepared and you're thoughtful. I mean, you ha you have a long history in this industry and you've done really good work and you've done smart work and that helps a lot. So, uh, it's a pleasure to be on with you. And yeah, I've got the time. So, uh, as you suggested before, you know, when you, uh, get your other other podcast uh, up and rocking, I'll be happy to come on and talk with you there as well. It's been a real pleasure. Yeah, I can't wait to do that. So yes, I will stay tuned for that. So thank you so much for your time. I think, Chris, the overarching theme of this conversation has been pretty much about community. Feels like that, right? Well, yeah, yeah. You know, these are fractious times and, and it's a message that we can only, you know, and especially with people having to isolate and not having so many of the, the activities that do keep community going, it, it's, it's even more important, I think, to keep it in mind at this time. Yeah. And um, yeah, you know, we, we don't know what the times ahead will be like. I do think it's going to be better in the spring, but we have a few rough months to go for sure. Yeah. Yep. Right there with you. But I certainly can't wait to get back to concerts and spending oh, yeah. more time with loved ones and enjoying yeah. music and yeah. dining out and all that stuff that we've been missing. Absolutely. So, um, as we wrap up, where can our listeners go to find out more about you? Well, they can go to my website, medicinehunter.com. They can look at the Medicine Hunter Facebook page, Medicine Hunter Instagram don't look at my Twitter page. I mostly just rant at stupid <laughs> politicians. I think I'll politics. look there. <laughs> yeah, I, I say terrible things to politicians who deserve terrible things to be said to them. Um, so <laughs> that's not a place <laughs> to find health advice. <laughs> but um, so medicinehunter.com is a good place. And um, my books are on Amazon, as everybody's books are. So you can find them there as well. Yeah, that's perfect. Well, as always, I'll be sure to include links to all of these items and show notes just so people can find you easily. Thank and you, I look Chris. forward to seeing you and giving you a hug in person at some point, some show, some place down the road, Karina. <laughs> I'm thinking about Expo West, but honestly, yeah. maybe not this year. <laughs> it's yeah. like one well, of those I, things, you know? I'm booked. We'll see if it happens. Yeah. All my best to you, Chris. Thank you so much. Same to you. Many blessings. You take Need good care. Time. You as well. Now, listeners, as we wrap up here, it's time for that simple ask. Please share this episode with your friends and your family. You can even grab their phone, subscribe them to this podcast, 
and download them this episode. That way you'll be sure that they're more likely to listen because sometimes that's just what we need, that gentle nudge. It's through sharing the in-depth discussions like this one that we had today with the medicine hunter himself, Chris Killam, that we raise awareness, invite your community to care more so we can all create a better future for you, for your family, and for the climate, for our planet Earth. Together, we can create the future we want. I invite you to lean into your curiosity and that process of discovery. Encourage that wanderlust. There's always more to learn. Thank you now and always for being a part of this pod and this community, because together we really can do so much more. We can care more and we can be better. We can even regenerate earth. Thank you. Thanks for listening to Care More, Be Better, a podcast for social good. To make sure you never miss an episode, subscribe, rate, and review wherever you listen to podcasts. And share with your friends to help us reach more people and spread more social good.